All right. Welcome, everyone. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce Professor Viktor Chernozhukov as our keynote speaker today. He is the International Ford Professor in the Department of Economics at MIT and Center for Statistics and Data Science at MIT. He is a fellow of the Economic Society and the recipient of the Alfred P. Sloan Research Fellowship, the Arnold Zellner Award, and the Bessel Award. He was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and, a, and is a fellow of the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Professor Chernozhukov works primarily in econometrics and statistics. His contributions are incredibly broad and multifaceted. In fact, many of his contributions are of direct relevance to causal inference, one of the primary topics of interest to the UAI community. Some of Professor Chernozhukov's contributions include post work in post-selection inference, semi-parametric inference using machine learning methods, non-regular models, and partial identification. The title of his talk today will be, long story short, omitted variable bias in causal machine learning. Please join me in welcoming Professor Chernozhukov. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you, Vladimir. Thank you very much for this opportunity and, uh, and, uh, and also for the um, introduction. So this is... Um, yeah, I wish I could be there in person. I really wanted, but uh, for for uh, for Victor, one sec, one sec. I think we have some issues with the audio. Mm -hmm. Uh, okay, Victor, I think we should be okay. Apologies. Okay. Can you try to say something? Cool. Yeah. Th thanks. Can, can you hear me well? Excellent. We can. Please. Apologies for the interruption. Yeah. No, no worries. Yeah. Thank you so much for the for this opportunity and for the uh, for the introduction. Uh, I really wish I could be there in, in person. Uh, unfortunately, for uh, for health reasons, I couldn't. I couldn't travel at this uh, at this point, um, but uh, anyway, I'm ha happy to be uh, to to be there virtually. So uh, I'm I'm going to present this paper that uh, that is joint work with the team of statisticians, com uh, co computer scientists, and econometricians, uh, Carlos Sinelli, who is over at the U uh, Stats Department at uh, UW. Uh, Whitney Newey, who is my colleague at MIT, Amit Shar Sharma, who is over at Microsoft Research, and Vasily Sarganis, who is over at uh, Stanford, uh, Stanford University. Um, the paper is available via Archive, and, uh, and the software, uh, the, the, it's been also implemented in the software now, uh, both in R and, and, and Python, in case anyone wants to, uh, wants to try. Um, so I have this motivating uh, slide about smoking and lung cancer and, uh, and the debate about the mitigated variable biases in, in, in that, in that uh, context, but I'm not good at motivations, uh, and so I'm going to skip the slide and just, uh, just go directly to, to, uh, to the paper. So what do we do in the paper? Uh, we, we, uh, we, uh, in the paper, we construct simple and uh, sharp uh, bounds. 
on the size of a mitted confounder uh, bias uh, for general non-parametric models. And, uh, and the particular examples of parameters of interest that we cover include um, average potential outcomes, or sometimes they're called policy values, depending on the context. Um, average treatment effects, uh, including uh, including sub subgroup effects, um, such as the effects for the treated. Average causal derivatives, um, average effects from transporting covariates, average effects from distributional changes in covariates. So these all these all parameters they fall into one single framework that could be analyzed in a, in a very in a very simple uh, way. Um, we show that the size of the immediate confounder bias for these parameters depends on the additional variation that the latent confounder creates in the outcome and in the treatment. And formally, the latter is captured by the variation uh, of the Ritz representer for the parameter of interest. This may sound a little bit mysterious at this uh, point, but I'll show you examples and you'll see that this is uh, the, the, uh, to, uh, yeah, to kind of de demystify this, uh, this statement here. Um, and then imposing uh, con hopefully contextually motivated bounds on these variational gains generates the, the bias bounds and also leads to, uh, to, to bounds on the, on, the, on the underlying causal uh, parameter of interest. So we don't stop there. Like so, in principle, yeah, getting the bounds is good, but we don't stop there. We also develop uh, efficient statistical methods for to 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 uh, for estimating or learning those by uh, bounds using uh, uh, devising uh, ideas using machine learning to learn the components components of, of the bounds. Um, so let me uh, let me proceed with the uh, setup. Uh, I'm gonna set things up in the, in the, using like structural uh, equation models language, uh, the, the UDA Perl language, but it's also classical language of econometrics. Um, so, so suppose we uh, just as an example, suppose we work with a structural equation model where you have uh, an equation for the uh, outcome variable y. So you have this y, and then you have some structural function g of y that is applied to, to, the, uh, to the variables that determine the y. So you have the d, the policy variable. So here, d is going to be a policy variable. x are going to be the observed confounders. a's are going to be unobserved confounders. Epsilon y is going to be independent stochastic shock. So this is the equation for y. Then you have the equation generating, structural equation generating the policy variable or treatment variable. Then you have equations generating the uh, the uh, the axis, the observed uh, values, and then you have the equation that generates the confounders, and then the as in Perl's work, the the these these stochastic terms here, the, the epsilons are going to be independent across the equations, and that leads to the um, um, to I mean this is uh, this this the, this model is equivalent to a, a causal directed acyclical graph. This one, the simple one that you see over here. So you have your uh, y, you have d, you have x, which is observed, and then you have this latent uh, confounders that are circled, uh, shown as a circled node. So then uh, we know that by the first law of, uh, of causal inference, uh, the, um, uh, the, that you um, uh, 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 likes to promote, we know that uh, any structural equation model generates uh, implies potential outcomes. In particular, if we if we set the policy variable to to a fixed value d in the, in the first equation, then we define these counterfactual quantities or or potential outcomes. Um, that result from this hypothetical intervention. And uh, given the setup, it's straightforward to deduce that the independence of the disturbances uh, implies the standard conditional ex exogeneity or ignorability condition, namely the potential, the potential outcome is independent of the uh, policy variable controlling for or adjusting for X, uh, for X and A, right? So in principle, you know, like in principle, I could have just started with this equation. So give me potential outcomes, giving me X's and A's. I could just start here, um, but it's also useful to, 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 to start with structural uh, equation models because a lot of people actually operate, uh, operate uh, using uh, the latter language. Of course, one should not hear that the conditional exogeneity condition that, that, that we are taking here as a starting point is uh, derivable not 
from this dog, but also it's derivable from lots of other dogs. Like we could have like the arrows, uh, some of the arrows being reversed, or we could have the latent variables appearing in different parts of the graph, or we could have the, the axis being measurements of this latent, uh, latent confounder A. Um, so like any uh, so any any one of those dogs implies the conditional exogeneity or ignorability condition that's going to be used uh, in, in in what follows. So anyway, under this conditional exogeneity condition, it's standard result in the literature that well we can uh, identify the conditional expectation of the potential uh, potential outcome given x and a by by just regression. So by the conditional expectation of y given given D, uh, uh, given X and A. And, um, and this conditional expectation over here, we're gonna be de uh, uh, de denoting by G of D, uh, D, X and A. And um, um, I'm gonna be calling this the long, the long regression because later on we will also have a long, short regression. So the long regression refers to the fact that, well, here, if we, uh, had we observed this X, X and A, we would be running this long regression of y on, on, on d, x, and a to identify this quantity. But uh, later on, because we don't observe a, we, we, we have to uh, run the short regression and um, uh, by, by dropping a. And so therefore, the, the, these, the, we have these names long and short. So these are like traditional names in, in econometrics. So anyway, so so that's this, uh, the the standard result so far. So we 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 yeah, if we if we observe A, we could identify uh, we could identify this conditional expectation by um, uh, by by just regression conditional expectation of the counterfactual. Um, and then um, uh, given this, we could also uh, uh, define some causal uh, some some causal parameters of interest. Uh, that summarizes those like causal effect. So one one param parameter of interest could be the average causal effect. Um, uh, this is relevant for the case where uh, D is binary. So here you have uh, uh, average causal effect is, is identified as the average difference in in the uh, in the potential outcomes uh, that result from setting the policy variable to values one and zero, and this quantity. This causal quantity is identified by uh, by uh, by the average difference in the two regression functions, where the the policy the the actual policy variable is the like we're fixing here like the, the, this value to be zero and and, and, the, and the other regression is one, so it's the average difference in the two two long regression functions that identify this parameter. Uh, if D, if D is, uh, the policy variable is continuous, then we can uh, look at the average causal derivative. So like we can look at the average derivative of the potential outcome and then average over the, the uh, realized values of the policy variables. And this is identified by the um, uh, average derivative of the regression, long regression function. So these are the two running examples that I'll be using uh, in, in my presentation. I, and um, and uh, like things to note here is that, well, first of all, these are linear, these are all like linear in Gs, like linear, so, so these are linear in Gs, right? Uh, so this is, this expression over here is linear in G, this is also linear in G. Um, so that's gonna be important. And another point is that this linearity. Uh, so, so there are like actually other lots of other examples that are going to be that the, the, that are going to have this linear linear property. So um, and they're all going to fall in 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 just one framework. So here we're looking at the average. Like another one is the average incremental effect. So for example, if d is is a count variable, then uh, we might be interested in the average causal effect of incrementing the, the D by, by, by a value of one. So that's gonna be that. And again, this is some linear functional of the regression uh, function. Um, then we could also be fixing fixing some some expectation of a, of, of a counterfactual and and then seeing how how uh, how um, how uh, like uh, looking at the uh, average value of this uh, of this expectation by integrating against different distributions and and then and then changing the distributions so this comes up a lot in um in uh, oxy, like in the, in the decomposition analysis like oxica binder decomposition like used used widely in social sciences and, and uh, like uh, and, um, economics 
um, and also co comes up as quantities that uh, that enter like like if, uh, the like mediation like uh, mediation analysis uh, things like this right so this is another so this this causal parameter is also like you could see that this is going to be some linear a linear function of this g uh, or this g of the long regression function. And then there are like other examples that that are of this nature that uh, could be looked up in the, in, the, in in the paper. Okay, so our key problem is that these latent uh, variables a are not observed. So what do we do about this? Well, we uh, uh, we can always in practice uh, estimate short regressions, right? So, okay, we don't observe A, but we can always run the regression uh, of Y on DNX. And at least in, uh, in principle uh, with uh, infinite amount of data, we could retrieve the uh, conditional expectation of Y given uh, DNX. That's gonna be the short regression denoted by G sub S. Um, uh, so that we can always, yeah, obtain, obtain this uh, quantity, at least in, in principle. And then, of course, we could also know that this is uh, this quantity here is going to be the projection or the conditional expectation of the long regression given the short list of regressors. Um, then, given the short regression, uh, then uh, what can we do? Well, we can actually mimic uh, mimic the the long parameter, the, the the true causal parameters, the way they they are identified. So, for example. Uh, for the average causal effect, we could take the difference between the two short regression functions to be the proxy uh, or approximation uh, for the for the true parameter theta. Uh, for the average derivative, uh, an analogously, we could just use the average derivative uh, of uh, of the short of the short regression as a proxy. And so, and then um, our goal then is to is to is to is to is to analyze how much theta of s can deviate from the from the true target. So we would like to have an expression for this bias, and also uh, have a, uh, ways of systematically bounding the size of the bias uh, under the assumptions that limit the strength of confounding. And we would also like to perform statistical inference on on theta. Yeah, theta is not going to be identified, but it's going to be partially identified. So we we uh, so there are going to be some bounds, and we would like use to use machine learning to perform statistical inference on those bounds. So confidence bounds for the bounds. So um, anyway, so in terms of the literature, like where we uh, where we yeah like yeah. So this is uh, this investi investigation is uh, motivated by. Um, classical uh, metered variable bias formulas that we, uh, like some of us teach linear regression, so we always teach uh, teach a metered variable, like a metered variable bias as, as part of the uh, uh, results. Obviously there's there was an important work by uh, Paul Rosenba Rosenbaum that uh, for like for bounding average causal effects, so that's also, and then there's a, the, the quite a big literature on, on, on uh, for, like for, uh, uh, in, in in that regard, like following up on on Rosenbaum taking different approaches. So in terms of uh, in terms of where we stand, uh, probably uh, uh, it it seems like well at least like in one in one simple framework we can cover lots of uh, like a whole class of examples. Uh, the analysis is non-parametric, so no linearity assumptions, no nothing like this. Uh, we get simple and uh, arguably easily interpretable bounds, although this is like in the eye of the beholder. I'll, I'll, I'll claim that these, these are easily interpretable, but you may, you may not agree. Um, and also the, these bounds are gonna be sharp. And we also gonna provide statistical uh, in, in inference, namely we're gonna uh, provide confidence bounds for the bounds using uh, debiasing, debiasing ideas. Um, so to state the, re the results uh, formally, to state the results formally, uh, 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 I will introduce the following uh, notation. So W is going to be the long list of regressors. So it's going to be my policy variable, the X, the observed covariates, and, and then A are the latent covariates. So this is the ideal list of regressors that I would like to have. And then there is a short list of regressors uh, where uh, where we are missing A, right? So this is what we observed here in the X. The first assumption is going to is going to be about the, the causal target target parameter. So the, the assumption is that this the target parameter can be uh, expressed or identified as as uh, by the, by this formula. So th theta is going to be equal to is going to be equal to 
uh, the some uh, some m score uh, applied to a data vector w, and it's also going to be indexed by g by this uh, by, by the regression long regression function. And what we're going to insist on is that well, this is this functional has to be linear in g, so this uh, the, the dependence on g has to be linear here. And another assumption that's going to be more a bit more uh, a, a bit more involved actually is not not a trivial assumption is that the the mapping from G to uh, to the uh, to the right hand side uh, has to be continuous in G with respect to the L two um, L two norm. So we we see that well in in the running examples that I had before the 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 linearity of the scores is is uh, trivially hold because these scores are linear in G right. Um, uh, to make this condition hold, the continuity, the property uh, hold, uh, we need to assume a weak overlap conditions, which are reasonable conditions because they, 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 they're typically uh, uh, much weaker than the strong overlap conditions used in the, in, in the literature. But anyway, so, so I'm not going to state these conditions uh, like sufficient conditions, but one can find them, look them up in the paper, obviously. <clears throat> Another assumption we need is the assumption about the short uh, parameter. Um, so here, the assumption is that uh, the short parameter uh, theta sub s is generated by the same formula where we replace the g by the short regression function g, g, g sub s. And the assumption on the score is that, well, in that case, it's going to simplify. The score is going to depend only on the, like, once we plug in G sub S in there, the score is only going to, like, is, 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 is going to depend only on a short list of uh, vari variables. Uh, and so this, this assumption is actually trivially satisfied in the running example. So this is relatively non-controversial <laughs> non -controversial assumption. Um, uh, then, uh, so then our goal again is to provide the expression for for the, for this difference the short uh, sh the short parameters uh, sh short parameter uh, minus the long parameter and also provide the bounds uh, for this parameter as well as perform statistical inference okay so the key uh, the key uh, the key to the result uh, is going to be the consequence of uh, uh, the yeah the key the yeah it's going to be a consequence of the ries fraschet representation th theory that 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 implies um, that uh, there exist square integrable random variables alpha of w and alpha uh, sub s of w s which we can call uh, the the uh, the the long and the short Ritz representers, such that such that these formulas for the target parameters can be uh, can be rewritten as the inner product of this form. So here, like over here, we have that this is the expected value of g, the regression function times alpha of w. So this is an in inner product between g and, and alpha. So we started out with one formula and then we have another formula. And this alpha of W is called the Ritz representative. In principle, this formula has to work for all square integrable G. And, uh, um, and then uh, a similar, uh, a similar uh, statement is going to be true for the short, uh, for the short par uh, parameter. So then, uh, so this uh, Ritz representers exist, and moreover, uh, yeah, they are unique, and and also the short uh, short Ritz representer here is going to be the uh, like well conditional expectation, but more generally projection of of um, of, uh, of the longer representer on on on, on a sm smaller space. So here is conditional expectation given uh, given the short list of regressors W uh, W S. Um, so, uh, so th this is like, yeah, this is the uh, uh, the, the the lemma. Um, this this may be completely familiar, uh, or maybe not so familiar if you've seen this like very long time ago. Um, in case you uh, you, it's not like yeah. In, in case in the latter case, you uh, the following examples might be useful to to have some intuitions for this. So these uh, these Ritz representers actually readily available for many uh, for many key examples, um, but even if yeah they're not available, we can still like retrieve them uh, by solving an like a variational uh, problem that I'll describe in, in in the next slide. But right now, let's assume that we have this partially linear uh, uh, partially linear uh, uh, model 
uh, namely that the, G, the, the, the regression function G is equal to uh, a linear piece in D plus a nonlinear non-parametric piece in X and A. And similarly, assume also just for simplicity that the short regression is also partially linear in, in D, right? And then there is a non-parametric piece here. So in, if, if this is the case, then theta here is both the average causal effect and also average causal derivative. But it turns out that, yeah, so one way to, to identify this theta is, 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 is by learning this long regression function. But there is another way, which is the, uh, which is the uh, uh, Frischois-Lavel um, uh, uh, approach, or, or, or like partially, it's called also partialing out. So in principle, we could residualize the treatment. So we can take D, subtract of predicted value of D given X and A. So th this gives us the residual, the long residual. Um, and then we can regress y on 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 uh, on, on on this residual uh, and retrieve theta in this way. So this is equivalent to just uh, writing theta as equal to the expected value of y given given this alpha of w over here. So we're putting the second moment of this residual in the numerator. So this is this is just rewriting the the partialing out formula for 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 the least squares coefficient in the, in the, in the population. And of course, by, 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 by the law of iterated expectations, this is equal to the inner product between the regression function and, and this alpha of W. So now we actually verified, uh, we verified this special, ca special case of this uh, lemma, the, the Ritz representation lemma for this, like for this instance, right? Yeah. And it also works, and it should work for other instances as well. Like, for example, if we take the binary D and look at, at the case of average causal effects, then we see that the, what, uh, what's going to retrieve theta for us is the Horowitz-Thompson reweighting, right? So we could stick in uh, uh, um, Horowitz-Thompson reweighting here and then retrieve theta in, in, in that case. What is Horowitz-Thompson uh, um, uh, reweighting? Well, it's the it's the indicators indicators of the policy variables hitting the states one and zero normalized by the conditional probabilities of hitting those states. And then here we take the, uh, the, the difference. Uh, so that this is to retrieve the effect. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's gonna give us the Horowitz-Thompson formula for identifying the average causal effect or the reweighting approach. And then by the law of iterated expectations, we can rewrite it as the inner product of G with this Horowitz-Thompson uh, transform that we see here. And the analogous approach also works for the short uh, uh, rep representer. So simply we, in, 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 uh, in the expression, so like over here and over here, we, we just drop the A's, right? Like we, we erase the A's, we get the short representer uh, here and here. And we of course also could, could also take conditional expectations to go from one to another. Finally, for the average causal derivative, which is another running example that I wanted to mention, the way we retrieve the uh, <clears throat> retrieve the risk representer is, is integration by parts. Yeah, we, we are losing the derivative, the, the derivative with respect to G, we're trading it for the derivative with respect to the density function. So we end up with a logarithmic derivative of the conditional density function of the policy variable given X uh, and uh, NA. Um, so this is like integration by part. So this hopefully gives you some intuition for what these Ritz, uh, Ritz representers are. Uh, but anyway, in principle, we actually don't even need to, to, to know their, any of these analytical properties. Uh, we could just use the variational characterization for this Ritz represent, uh, representers in terms of this minimal energy problem. Uh, the risk representers uh, are minimizers of uh, of the optimization problem, where we are minimizing this the, the square of the candidate representer minus this the the score this two minus two times this m score applied to the data vector w and also indexed by a here. So we used to have g in here, but now we're plugging in a there. And we're minimizing over all or over all a's and l2. And we see that the first order conditions for this problem uh, are, are going to be, well, all the directional derivatives have to vanish so, so at the optimum. So if we take the, like the, these, the, the, these directions to, to be in L2, then we see that the first order conditions are going to be the expected value of the of AW times H 
uh, and that's that has to be equal to the expected value of the m score uh, uh, applied to the w and h. This has to hold for all h, and the only uh, the only prop the the only quantity or the only object that uh, obeys this uh, first order conditions for all h for all directions is the is, is the least that's represented. So in principle, this is useful characterizations in case where okay the the analytical characterization is not available. Uh, but it, uh, uh, so one could always say, okay, I can I can uh, solve this optimization problem and get my research presenter in this way. But so that's one uh, one thing. But it's also useful for actually for for uh, for estimation and for learning for learning these research presenters. So in principle, you could we could use the empirical analog of this problem to uh, to learn uh, to estimate these research presenters and then. We've, uh, we've we've so far we've tried the lasso methods, neural networks, and and random forests uh, to solve these learning problems, and there are promising results. And in particular, these uh, these uh, these seem to produce better behavior estimates of risk representers, like relative to the analytical approach, where you uh, you use the formulas and do some plugins. Like you like like over here, you could say, okay, I'm going to estimate estimate the uh, conditional probabilities plug in in this formula and get the get the, uh, the estimated research presenter in this way it turns out that um, using this variational characterization approach like it seems to produce better behaved uh, estimates in, 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 in practice anyway so uh, so this is the this is the, the this is the key lemma uh, key lemma. That, that states that the target parameters could be expressed as inner products between the regression function and the risk representer. So we have two sets of, uh, of uh, functions like long and short, right? Uh, so long, uh, long regression, long re representer, short regression, short representer. So once we have this key lemma, we can state the main, uh, main result, which is this. Um, and by the way, to, uh, the nice thing about this re result is that it's it derived, like once you have the lemma, it's derivable essentially on the blackboard in like three lines. Um, so we, um, yeah, so uh, the uh, immediate variable bias could be expressed as uh, the, uh, the covariance or the inner product between the regression error. So this is the regression error. Uh, and this is the uh, risk representer error. What kind of error? Like, well, these, these these are the errors that result from omitting the latent confounder, right? So if we if we drop the A's, like we're forced to use this uh, short uh, representer and short regression, so we're committing errors. And then the the bias is just the covariance between the 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 the, the, the these two two errors. And for for furthermore, we can. Uh, 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 express the square bias. So take take the difference squared. We can express the square bias as the row squared times b squared, where b squared is the product of the uh, second moments of those errors, and the row squared is the uh, correlation squared be between these uh, errors. And this, of course, this is trivial at bar bounded by b squared. Of course, this is question like I'm telling you, Cauchy Schwarz inequality, right? So then, uh, what is uh, so this bound b squared is the product of additional variations that omitted confounders a generate in the regression function and in the risk rep representer. And also another um, another point here, and it, it it's a simple point, is that this upper bound b squared is always attainable by by adversarial con con confounding because adversarial confounding can always set the row square to be one. So the correlation uh, between uh, the re uh, regression error and um, and the representative error could all, always be set to one by simply choosing the uh, choosing one error to be proportional to another, and this is always feasible. So if, if we work in, without any further restrictions on the problems, uh, this is always feasible, and so the adversary can always hit the upper bound, right? Um, so in that uh, in that sense, uh, these bounds are, are sharp. And so this uh, this bound also generalizes the uh, immediate variable bias formulas for linear models as well as some special cases that uh, like for for, uh, uh, for that the uh, um, Tomaso and, and and collaborators derived for um, average uh, derivatives. Um, so anyway, so yeah, that's the the, the formula, uh, and then. Um, 
we can uh, to take this to data it's, it's actually useful to 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 have further char char characterizations for the bounds and these were inspired by uh, by the work that Carlos Sinelli and Chad Hazlett did and and published this in GSSB this is like quite a quite a nice paper um, doing it just for, for linear regression um, 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 yeah, so they're highly recommended. But anyway, so this what I'm I'm going to show you is inspired by 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 by, by that. Um, so we we would like to further like interpret the bounds. Um, so to this end, we're going to express the bound as this product of three components. One component S squared is going to be learnable from the data, and then there are two comp other components that are not going to be learnable from the data. Uh, and so, so what are these components? So these components C, Y, and C, D are going to be are going to be measuring the strengths of confounding in Y, and the strengths of confounding in the treatment D, right? So in principle, yeah, we we cannot learn it from the observable data. So this would have to be pinned down from the from the context. This S squared here is going to be the scale of the bias that is identifiable from the data. And what is it? Well, it's going to be the um, the second moment of the short reads representer. So that's one component. And this this is what? This is the second moment of the short residual. So you take y subtract of predicted value of, uh, of y given d and x. Uh, that's the short residual here. And, and, um, and this gives you the expression for the um, s squared. Um, C, C, Y here uh, and C, D could be expressed in terms of R squared. So the R squared here, the notation R squared V tilde U means it's the R squared from the linear projection of V on U. And so we can, we can, uh, we can see that C, Y here is going to be the R squared where we take the short residual and regress, uh, regress it on the, uh, on the error, regression error that results from dropping the latent confounder, right? And um, the the other uh, and so what is this quantity here? It just measures the proportion of residual variance in the outcome that is explained by the latent confounders. In fact, this is uh, Pearson's non-parametric partial R squared, just ex expressed in terms of the linear R squared formula. So this is like a standard, completely standard expression over here that we have Pearson's non-parametric partial R squared. This is this piece is less standard. So what is this? Well. Like if we focus here in, on the numerator, this is uh, this this here measures the proportion of residual variance of the long uh, of the long of the long representer that is generated by the latent the latent confounders. So this uh, this is slightly you know maybe this is slightly less familiar, but when we go ahead and kind of like work it out for uh, for different leading examples. We, well, we we develop the the intuition. So first of all, for partially linear models, for partially linear models, this this factor here can again be expressed in terms of Pearson's non-parametric partial R squared. So in that sense, it's going to be completely interpreted interpretable and so on. For average causal effect, the stress the strengths of confounding in in D is actually going to be uh, so. This is average causal effect and non-parametric model. Uh, the strength of confounding in D is going to be measured by the relative gain in precision with which we predict the, the binary uh, variable D. So this is the gain in precision. Um, so I'm highlighting this, like maybe like if you were reading this, like, yeah, maybe it, 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 yeah, it's not immediate, immediate but yeah, it's, 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 it's that. Uh, also for average causal derivative, this factor here, it turns out to be the relative gain in the location information. So anyway, so you have all of these uh, ex expressions for these factors for for special uh, for special cases, and these are useful for like when we take this balance to the data. Um, in terms of um, in terms of statistical inference, um, I I I will be very brief. Uh, I will be very brief. I'll just say okay. So the bounds uh, the the bounds uh, take this form. So upper lower bound is going to be equal to the short parameter plus minus the scale times the C, Y, and C, D. This component C, Y, and C, D are going to be restricted through the hypothesis that, uh, that the analyst makes when they analyze the, the, the data. I'll show you uh, like a, an example of how we do this for, uh, for an example, for, for this 401k example. Um, uh, then uh, S here, 
the the s uh, s is the scale of the of the of the bias so in principle it's learnable from the data and theta theta s is the short parameter that's also learnable from the data so in principle we could just use the plugin plugin estimators for this s and theta sub s but it's it's better to use not the plugin but use the device or orthogonal representations for these target parameters so what are those uh, representations so for the short parameter, it's better to use this representation. So this is the natural piece here that we have here. So this piece over here is natural piece. Uh, but then we're adding this correction. Um, here, what this correction does, it, it makes this representation, like one property is called double, like double robustness, but another property is orthogonality or local robustness, meaning that if we perturb if we if we uh, if we take this expression here and then perturb this expression around, so take take the partial derivative respect to G and alpha around the true values, the derivative vanishes, right? So this is uh, this is good property to have if you wanna uh, if you wanna uh, use uh, machine learning or other uh, heavily regularized estimators of of G and, and alpha, and we have to do like yeah, and 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 everybody you know everybody uses these estimators. Uh, um, in modern uh, modern uh, data work, then for the uh, to estimate uh, this uh, moment, the second moment of the residuals, we actually don't need to do anything. So this is also like this is automatically uh, debased or uh, orthogonalized. Uh, for to estimate the second moment of the risk representer, we we should not use this expression. We better use this expression, which is the value of the objective function that uh, that uh, the that, that its uh, representer optimizes. Uh, why why do, why do we use this? Well, because this uh, this is going to have this robustness property or orthogonality property. Why? Well, because well by the first order conditions or by the envelope theorem, that derivative is going to be vanishing. Um, and so we're going to have reduced sensitivity to the uh, to, to using the plugins in, 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 in instead of the true values of these parameters, right? So the first order biases are going to be eliminated by using expressions like this. And in the end, so yeah, we end up using this these types of scores for learning components of these bounds. Uh, so in essence, it's a, yeah, it's a method of moments estimator for the components of the bound using these orthogonal scores. Not not the naive score, but the orthogonal uh, scores, and also using uh, cross-fitting uh, to learn the nuisance functions, which are the regression function here in the Ritz representer. And of course, this draws on the classical ideas in semi-parametrics, like uh, uh, starting with Neiman and uh, uh, starting with Levitt uh, uh, in the 70s, and Bergimov, Hasminski, and going on to she, she, uh, she, uh, Anthony Schick and um, and um, uh, others in the 80s. Um, I, I guess the, yeah. Anyway, so this leads to, to nicely behaved uh, estimators of the components of the of the of the bounds, right? Statistical statistical bounds. So um, I have some formal statements over here, but uh, I'll I'm skipping those uh, formal statements, and I'll just say that well, the 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 end product is that we. What we're able to give you is the uh, confidence bound, say L and U, like lower and upper confidence bound, which are the form uh, where you have an estimated uh, lower bound, estimated upper bound, and it's going to be plus, plus, plus or minus. Uh, there's going to be like a critical value, critical value here, critical value. And then uh, this is the standard error, uh, standard error. And that's going to be, uh, that's going to have the property of covering the true causal parameter. Uh, with probability no less than uh, the, the the probability that we want, um, you know, provided of course that we made the, uh, the 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 correct assumptions about the strength of confounding, right? Um, so that's um, that's the uh, the the end result of this. Um, in terms of, uh, so I'm going to conclude my talk by by showing you uh, an application. Uh, that um, that revisits this four uh, one k example that goes back to the analysis by Pater Bavent and Weiss in the in the nineties. So um, so there we're interested in the effect of uh, D, which is the eligibility to enroll in the four one k program, which is the large private pension plan in the U S. Like well, U S. people know this, like non U S. people not may not know this. Then there is this Y, which is the savings essentially or net financial assets for these data sets. Then 
at the time, uh, Pater Baitan uh, collected the data on the uh, uh, worker, uh, worker level characteristics, so basically worker characteristics. They couldn't uh, get the data on firm characteristics. Um, and then th there are also <clears throat> other variables uh, in the background that could play a role. I'll, I'll mention those later. But anyway, so so what happened then, like in that paper, as well as the like many lots of other papers that uh, reuse this example over and over, uh, they use the uh, in essence they use the dog the, the dog of this or the causal model of this sort, right? So you have this y, you have t, you have worker characteristics x over here. Uh, then you might also have, okay, firm characteristics here. You could have latent factors affecting, determining both the firm characteristics and the worker characteristics in, in the labor market. But the bottom line here is that, well, controlling for X here is enough because it um, closes all the backdoor paths uh, that create an causal association between Y and D. Um, so controlling for X is, is good enough here to, uh, to uh, and, and, and so lots of people use this, uh, this type of reasoning to, to estimate the effect of 401k on, on the averages or distributions and, and so on. Um, so here, how the estimates look like, this is just, just for, for, for contrasting later. So uh, like if we assume the, the left panel as our model, then, uh, the the average effects turns out to be around 9k so this the the, the positive effect of around 9000 if we look by income groups uh, then we see the effect varies from 5k to uh, 20k so these are point estimates and these are confidence uh, confidence like 90 percent uh, 90 95 percent confidence bands um, of course like in in that uh, for that problem, Actually, I, I've been teaching that the left panel for a long time. And I said, well, like, wait a minute, where is the match amount? The match amount, uh, the match amount is the important characteristic uh, of, of a 401k plan. Basically, it's the proportion uh, that your employer matches. Like, so let's say you contribute 10,000 10, uh, to your uh, 401k saving, and then the employer can match like 50% or 100%. And that obviously is going to affect your, your Y. So if we put the match amount in the picture, then, then like obviously we're going we're gonna to have the, uh, the uh, effect on, on Y. And it's like undis undisputable. Like, yeah, you could double your savings like if, you, if your employer is very generous. Um, uh, and the, the only way you, 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 like you, you, you have the access to this match amount only if you're eligible, right? So there's an error from D to M. Uh, and also it's hard to argue that the firm characteristics do not affect the match amount they do because yeah, the generosity of the employer is exactly the, the, uh, the characteristic that, uh, uh, that we have in mind here. And so then what do we have here? Well, we have a backdoor path, right? Like we have an additional backdoor path that is not blocked by X. So over here we had X blocking all the backdoor paths, but now it's not the this backdoor pass is not blocked. So we worry about this omitted firm characteristics in the analysis. So the way we then uh, go, uh, we, we we specify a specific confounding scenario where where. Um, um, uh, where I would say like, yeah, this, the, we, 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 we say, okay, suppose F explains as much variation uh, in, in, in net financial assets as the maximum match amount of, uh, over, over, the, uh, over the period of three, uh, sorry, yeah, yeah. Oh, Oh, yeah, so yeah, that what I said, yeah, over the period of three years. So basically, this is mechanically, this is, uh, this could be argued to be the, the mechanical upper bound on, on the strength of compounding in, 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 in why that one could generate this. This was suggested to me by uh, Jim Paterba. Um, uh, then um, for strengths of compounding in D, uh, what I suppose is that I suppose, okay, suppose F explains additional. Uh, 2.5% variation in 401k eligibility, which is a 20% relative increase in the baseline as squared, starting with the, the, the base of 13. So this is like a fairly, like, a, like uh, this, this is like a fairly strong assumption on, 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 this, on this F uh, compared to, to some of the observable covariates. So this, this gives, a, gives me a fairly conservative scenario. Like it gives me this, like the bottom line, it gives me this number CY and CD. 
that I can plug in in the, in the, in the bias formulas and construct the bounds. So the bounds that I get are these, they are shown by these uh, red, red curves. So you see the, like, okay, so now we have the bounds instead of just a single, like a singleton curve. And then, uh, and then these, these blue curves are confidence bounds for the bounds. So this is what this machinery uh, does. Of course, one could say here, I'm not happy about the scenario that I, I took. Maybe I would like to entertain other scenarios uh, that's fine. So, so in principle, one could do uh, one could one could do kind of um, uh, visual sensitivity analysis where, on the horizontal axis, you have strengths of confounding in 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 in, in the treatment. This is going to be strengths of confounding in Y on the vertical axis. The particular scenarios that we considered, like well, okay, no confounding is, is here. Another one is here, and and what are we showing here? Well, we're showing the the lower the lower bound estimated lower bound here so like we like the if we assume no confounding we had this nine nine thousand the average effect and then if we the scenario that we consider it gives us around this five thousand but uh, this is just a dot in the, in, in the space so if you, if you take any other scenario where we are below this red curve okay then we like it's not going to overturn the conclusion similarly you can do this with confidence so instead instead of plotting the like just the estimate you could plot the lower confidence bound and so you get you get the score like the sensitivity plots with with um with confidence and also one can do benchmarking analysis similar to what uh, uh um, some some people like to do like Emilia Oyster and, and others and Hido um, but I'm gonna skip here and jump to the conclusion. So in conclusion, I wanna say, yeah, we construct simple and sharp bounds on the size of the immediate confounder bias for a class of causal parameters uh, that seem to encompass like many interesting examples. The size of the bias depends on the additional variation in the latent confounder that the, the, the latent confounder creates in the outcome and the, and the, and the, in the in the representer uh, for the parameter of interest, assuming bounds on this variation gains implies an overall bias bound and will also provide statistical inference for these bounds. Thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions if there's time. Thank you so much, Victor, for a wonderful talk. Uh, we, we have a, a bit of time for questions from the audience. I think we have mics and stuff. So. Uh, if you do have a question, raise your hand and we'll uh, get to it. So actually, while you're thinking, I have a question, Victor. So um, so you're you're doing the setup that people think about where you have conditional ignorability given a, a hidden variable mm -hmm. and you try to do something with that. And you know, you just play it graphically like people often do these days. And you know, I'm gonna ask the kind of question I often ask, which is you could get complicated graphs. You could get complicated identification. You could try to do G computation, for example, with hidden variables. And that's like one case. You could also do more general crazy stuff with the ID algorithm. And very often you could think about stuff like that, about doing sequentially kind of ignorability type things. Uh, mm -hmm. it, maybe it could be that for some of these steps or all of these steps, there is also some omitted variable. And my question about this kind of method, like how plug and play is it? Like, is it possible to derive results of this type for sequential applications of this where some use are present in various places? Uh, that that's a, yeah, that's a very, like, yeah, I would say it's very formidable, formidable question. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so so I guess uh, like what like what our approach does, it kind of mimics mimics a practice of like what people do with linear regression. So in that in that case, maybe it's not as uh, as uh, intellectually ambitious as like taking a, like a, a complicated structural equation model, like uh, and and trying to do sensitivity sensitivity analysis or uh, identification with like hidden variables and uh, of sorts. And doing bounds like uh, so in principle yeah one could just do one could say yeah i want to build bounds for the uh, parameters of interest given uh, given given uh given the causal graphs like with, with but the, it, and so on but but uh, I'm, I'm i'm kind of who, who knows like maybe yeah maybe there's some scope for like simplification like right there so like here we are like the approach is that okay so you you can always get your kind of 
short estimate, which is like a, a thing that people often do. Like they run a regression, they say, okay, so we find this effect. Um, is it is this result robust? Or like what what can uh, like what sort of conf like how strong should the uh, confounding be to overturn this result? And um, um, so this is yeah, this is the approach that we take. I'm not like yeah, and then um, the the uh, yeah, I'm not sure how it's going to work with the like what what. Um, Okay, so it sounds like I mean that's really what I was asking. Like very often, like there there is a there is a particular kind of trick you can do yeah. with a single yeah. step, conditional yeah. ignorability, and sometimes you don't have to think anymore. But it doesn't sound like that's what's going to happen here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, are there any other questions from the audience? In the meantime. Great. Okay. Uh, so, Victor, thank you so much. Uh, so, the recording we will uh, there will be a recording of this, of course. And uh, thank you so much for agreeing to uh, give this wonderful talk to UAI. AI. Uh, and it's good to see you. Uh, let's thank. Uh, let's everyone thank Victor again. Thank you so much.